basically today we're going to do an ash bowl which has been chainsaw textured low torch and then uh, different waxes applied the very degree in gold wax um, simple little G shape on the bottom I will be leaving the chucking point in um, this piece that I make today will probably end up being stuck in the in my gallery um, and I have worked out now that generally uh, the general public don't really know what a chucking point is it's only wood turners and obviously uh, I know all too well if somebody comes into my shop and they pick a bowl up and they do that I know they're a wood turner and they aren't going to buy anything off me they're just going to come and pinch some ideas so uh, this is what we're going to be making today I've got a piece of ash I've it was a little bit warped so I have took the liberty of taking some of the extra weight off already um, I'll be holding it basically onto an Axminster screw chuck. Let's, let's go to that cam. So basically, that part goes into the standard jaws. And then these bits are just uh, can't be an eighth of an inch thick plastic, which I use just as spacers so I don't have to use the full thread going into my blank. I'm just going to fuel them on. And I've got a piece of kiln dried ash. Um, I believe this is a piece from Germany. One of my suppliers bought a load of German ash and it had been kilned really quickly and it's gone really hard and brittle. So it's actually a bit of a pain to work with because it does chip quite easily and tear out quite easily. But it's also a good piece to do with demos because if I get lots of problems, I've got to get over them while you're watching. Um, I will bring up my uh, my tail centre, even though it's on the screw chuck, which should be safe enough. I'll nearly always bring up the tail centre when I can, just to add an extra bit of security. I normally wear a full face uh, helmet, um, but obviously doesn't really work very well when I've got headphones and microphone on. Um, if I remember, I'll put my face shield on, but normally I've got a full respirator air fed helmet, which works really well. I've also got, um, as you can see down here, six inch dust extraction through all my workshops, going through a big cyclone extractor. And I've got uh, an overhead ambient air filter um, about six foot away from me. So initially, all I'm going to do is just try and level up this face and this edge. Well, that's fairly close now. And then I'll start putting some shape on it. Most of the work I'll do initially will be with a long grind bowl gouge. I've just started changing the shape of my long grinds. No one showed me how to do a long grind when I first started turning. And I've always carried on with them how, they, how I learned to do it but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a very good grind. So I'm now just changing the shape slightly to a more uniform shape, because sometimes when I have uh, students in, they say that my grind is so different to theirs, they struggle to use them. But basically I'm gonna rub the bevel, roll the tool over, pick up the cut, and I'll do a few passes just to level off the space. Once I've got it actually cutting, and I know my angle that I need the tool presented at, I pretty much won't change the angle of the top half of my body. I'll just lean forward onto my leading leg by the tool, start doing the cut, and then I'll just transfer my weight over to the back leg. So basically the top half of my body is pretty much staying in the same, same position. So I don't have to worry about when I come off to one again, and I'm always going to be going straight back onto the cut. I've got it somewhere near flat, so I'm now going to start taking away some of the excess timber. As I come around this leading edge, as I come around, I'm going to start doing this going from a pull cut to a push cut.
Obviously, ordinarily I would be wearing my smock, but it's actually quite warm in my workshop this afternoon. I haven't had the doors open because I'm normally closed on a Sunday now. So I'm just in the just in my t-shirt, otherwise I'll be stripping sweat everywhere. So I've got the uh, end of the tool handle against my thigh. So as I'm trying to inform this shape, I'm actually pushing the tool with my body rather than relying on my hands to push it over. Until I get to this point, rather than move my legs, I'll then just use my arms and actually push the tool into the wood. The worst of the roughing done. I'll do some a uh, couple of quick clear up cuts on the outside and then I'll start forming my foot and my chucking point. Now at the moment I'm basically going against the grain, the ship is coming up from the other direction. At the moment these are only just rough shaping cuts. And now because I'm going to have a convex surface on the top here, I want to work out where I've got flat edge to work to. This outside, inside face here is not running true, running out quite a bit. Hopefully you can see that. So I'm just gonna go in here and take a couple little cuts off this edge until I'm actually cutting solid wood all the way around. So I know that could be the finished surface of my top of my bowl. I'm just gonna go in with a parting tool. I don't want to take too much timber away. Let's have a look at that. Basically, I'm just trying to work out my starting point and my finishing point here and here, so I know what shape my finished bowl will be. And pretty much that there. It's gonna be roughly where I need to be. So I'll put a slight cook on uh, convex curve on the top here. 
So the bottom of my bulb will probably start off at this point and then curve over the top. There, so I've still got about three eighths thickness in the middle here, so that's fine. So now I want to start looking at my chucking point on the bottom. So I'll take away the tail center. Now I've done most of the uh, aggressive work. I'm using um, a Vicmark chuck, which has got, um, I can't remember what the measurement is now on this one, 70 mil dovetail spigot. Um, quite often I see people, especially in demos, using vernier calipers to set the diameters and things for their spigots. Um, my only concern, but especially novices using these, if the white hand leg catches, obviously it comes up and we've got this long pointy bit coming straight towards our faces. Um, so I do use them occasionally, but beginners, I always say steer away from those. Another alternative that I started using was hinge dividers. Basically works on the same principle. The left leg scores the wood, line it up with the right leg. Do not touch the right leg on the surface of the timber, but should that catch, it's gonna flick over and we haven't got any long spiky bits coming towards us. So a slightly safer option. I forgot to check the dimension on my one here. Let me just extend that a little bit. By far the safest and easiest way in my mind is I've already got a center point on the end here. Let's try the close up cam. I've already got the center point where my tail center was. So if I use a set of compasses, I've now marked out the size of my dovetail recess without the lathe spinning, no risk at all. And I've now got my center, my diameter I need marked on there, nice and safe, nice and simple, um, without any risk of anything flying around through the air. I'm now going to start opening up from my center just using a standard eighth parting tool initially just to get the approximate depth that i want Just checking the line of that face. I might have to do another cut off there in a minute. So I'm just going to make this slightly deeper. In my own workshop, without all you people watching me, I'd be quite happy to turn this with a two or three millimeter dovetail recess. But uh, as funny as it would be for you guys if you saw it come flying off the lathe, I don't particularly want it to happen. I'm just gonna actually hide. I'm gonna take the rest of that out the middle there with the standard grind bowl gauge. Just to lay speed a little bit. One of the problems we often get as beginners is we always end up with either a pimple or a dimple in the, in the middle. If you end up with a pimple, rather than try and force the tool past it, watch off, which can result in a bit of end grain or get the grain breaking out. As you get to the middle, if you open up the flute and rub on the side of the bevel, and try a bigger tool so you can see what I'm talking about. If I can focus on there. So what I'm going to be trying to do is actually using the side of the wing about halfway up to actually slice through the fibers that are creating this pimple. So you're doing a normal cut. I'm going to raise the handle up very slightly. You've still got the bevel rubbing and I can just slide the tool underneath 
and hopefully the pimple will come off where it is laying in my hand so it hasn't pinged off and gone halfway across the workshop which basically means that I won't have any torn grain in there at all that will be a nice clean finish if there is anything untoward in there it's going to be so minute I won't have to worry about it so I get to that point I've got that funny little bit sitting there lift the handle use the side wing and it falls off straight into the palm or straight into the flute of the tool so it's a very gentle cut it's almost like using a skew chisel right in the middle there using the sharp wing of the tool and slicing it off rather than forcing it off I put a marker disc on my on my work so I've got these little discs made up out of stainless steel which have been uh, laser cut so they fit into the middle of all my work um, I've also got a little tiny point right in the center a little tiny hole just in front of my finger there so as long as I cut the hole in the in the foot here that will sit in if I ever need to rechuck it I can bring a tail center up into the little dot making sure that I've got it centralized so I normally drill that once I've finished and the pieces off the lathe so I do want to put a little little indent in there just so when I come to, to drill it later on I know exactly where I need to drill so there I've got my little um, I can't quite see it there's a little tiny pimple in there now I'm going to cut my dovetail, I'm just going to use a round skew. When I get to the bottom of the cut, I can just use that as a little scraper. It's actually working like a shear scraper, so I can just run across the bottom and just tidy it up. My little disc of 35 millimeters diameter, so I know that once they're in there, I don't have to worry too much about the actual dead center. So now I just want to do a little leveling cut to get the face of what's going to be my foot nice and flat. Doesn't look too bad, but I'll just take a little tiny cleaning cut. very gently off the end into my dovetail recess so I don't break out any grain or splinter off any bits of wood. Now I am off the cut and I want to work out the approximate width of my foot in comparison to the overall width of the piece. So looking on there I'd probably say give myself maybe a half, half an inch foot, 12 and a half mil foot and I'll just go in here just to find that. So now I know roughly where I'm starting on this outer rim, or where I'm finishing on the outer rim and where I'm starting at the center of the, the bowl. So now I can start doing some push cuts just to remove some of that excess. I don't know if my shoulder's gonna be in the way. I'm trying to my camera should be okay. I'm not too sure what speed I'm actually turning at. I'm on the VB lathe and I'm on the middle belt which goes up to 1350 RPM. Um, but I'm probably only about seven tenths up to speed, so I'm around about 1000 RPM. Now, ordinarily, I'd stop the lathe when I move the tool rest, but I don't want to spend a lot of time starting and stopping, so I'm just making sure I kept hold of the tool rest. I had full control over what was happening. On a 
of demo I'd done the other week, someone was asking, saying that whenever they started their lathe up, the lathe was shaking so much, they couldn't turn anything because uh, they had basically any piece of wood with two out of balance. So I'm now down to probably about 100 RPM. Um, basically, as long as you've got correct tool technique, you should be able to turn at pretty much any speed. Um, probably around about 100 RPM, maybe 150. The only real difference is the progression of the tool across the work. It won't be as good a cut. But you should be able to turn at just about any speed you want. Speed helps because there's less resistance to the cut. But it's not essential, you don't have to have your lathe bouncing all over the workshop. As long as your tool technique is correct, you're applying the right amount of pressure. The bevel should only be floating on the surface, not rubbing too hard, but it's bouncing around. And get a bit more shape into that. Just come in here a little bit and take a little bit more out of the underside here. back up a bit more speed. My left hand is hardly doing anything, it's just controlling the amount of pressure slightly onto the tool or onto the surface of the wood. There's hardly any pressure. If I've got anything where I've got a dodgy bit of grain and the tool starts bouncing, what I'll do is put some weight on top of the tool. So there'll be two fingers, an underhand grip pulling down. But what you want is an even pressure. So I could go onto here. Normally I'd have my body up against the, the handle, but I'll just try and do it at arm's length. So I'm pushing down onto the tool and I'm using hardly any pressure onto the surface of the wood. And if you've got a bad bit of grain or a piece of grain that keeps making the tool bounce, having your tool pushed down rather than in will mean the tool will float over the difficult patch of grain. Let's have a quick look. So we're getting somewhere with the with the shape needs a little bit more detail underneath here. I'm going to do one cut going against the grain, just around here to try and make a little detail on the foot. So again, I'm actually going to swap over hands and come in left-handed. Um, something I taught myself to do. I can't normally do anything left-handed. But I was speaking to a professional turner and he said if you can turn left-handed as well as right, it can make a huge difference if you get to uh, something that's causing problems. shape on the bottom there. Then I'm hardly using any pressure onto the surface of the wood. I'm literally trying to float the tool around just for the bevel just touching. And if you can see this hand here, but I can literally do it just for two fingers how much effort I'm actually putting into the cut. My thumb is pushing the tool down onto the surface at the top of the tool rest. Now I'll just place that cut 
all the way off. Get it, so just coming from this end. Just going to clean off this outside edge. I've got this little bevel on here, which I'm not going to need as much of that. So I'll take some of, take some of that off. Here. Being too lazy to move the tool rest. I just had the tool slightly at a funny angle. I've got a couple of little catches. Um, ordinarily, on the underside, in my dovetail recess, I'll just put a little bit of decoration. For today, I'm just going to put a couple of little lines around there with a three point tool. All I'll do is just present the tool. I know I've got 35 mil disc going in there, so I'll just put a couple of grooves outside here. Just to look like I've actually uh, considered what the inside will be. And I'll just take this little tiny shoulder off here. That will be a little bit of a sharp edge. I could probably go straight in with the abrasive on that, but what I will do is I use negative rake scrapers a lot. Um, if you can see that on there, but basically two angles I've got on there are 40 degrees on both sides. So my included angle is 80 degrees. They work more efficiently if they're a cuter angle. Um, but the 40 degrees is what I've got my platform set to on my bench grinder. So rather than change that, so I've used my bowl gouges basically at 40 degrees, my standard grinds. So rather than keep changing the angle of the platform, I just sharpen these at the same time at 40 degrees. It gives me an included angle of 80 degrees, which is just enough. So I can take some nice little fine wispy shavings. I'm cutting pretty much on center line. There's virtually no pressure at all, literally the tool can literally lay in my hands. They're a very delicate tool to use. I just see a little line round there. I'm just gonna check what that is. It was no, I can't see anything. It's something in the in the grain showing up as a white line. Let's move the tool rest a little bit. This tool was a straightforward, straight grind tool. I've curved cut it or ground it into a slight curve. Um, I find if doing big platters, I can actually zigzag the tool across the tool rest and get nice and flat rather than trying to push it dead straight across. Um, this one is a crown, I think, bottoming uh, scraper. Normally a single radius on the end there. I've he heavily modified it so you can see underneath so it's more of a French curve type scraper. So the angle and the curvature coming around here changes all the way around. So I can get into a lot more different shapes all with the same tool, depending on how I present it. I'm just gonna take off any little high spots. I could have gone around there with another cut with the tool and just cleaned it up a little bit more. Let's go over to the overhead camera. So I can just get in just underneath this little shoulder. Just clean it up, just literally just using the tip of the tool. Literally just trying to float it over the surface. So this ash doesn't particularly like to be scraped because it is so brittle after being overkilled. You see that I'm getting shavings, which means it's cutting. If you're just getting dust coming off, you are scraping, but these are like long little 
shavings which are knitting together. But they are very thin, very light. Let's have a quick look. Take little marks there in the in the middle, but that should be okay. It's got to clean off this outside edge a little bit more. Just on this outer rim, there's a little tiny bit of breakout where I had to catch earlier. So I'm just gonna run over that, just try and take off another sixteenth of an inch. Seeing to see up on this edge here is a little tiny bit of breakout happens. So I've just got to try and clean that off a little bit more. Again, I'm just going to rub the bevel, pull out the handle, pick up my cup, and let that carefully run to the outside edge. Right, on the underside of the bowl here, I want to put a bead, which will then be matched on the other side. Uh, so I'll then frame the texturing that I have inside there. So I'm now going to just form a bead. I'm going to use three point tool again. You can range for something like a six, eight mil diameter bead on this edge. So again, I can just come in here with the three point tool. form the groove part of the bead and I'm just going to pick up on the surface and roll the tool around. I have the head cam see if it shows anything better. And this tool is actually cutting because I'm getting shavings, not dust. Tear out there, which hopefully will sand out. That should do. So now I'll uh, get rid of the tool rest and I'll start doing a to start on uh, the abrading. I nearly always use uh, power sanding, normally with a cordless drill. Uh, when I'm doing my big wall sculptures, I'll often use an angle grinder with a four and a half inch. Velcro pad on it. And start my uh, extractor. I'm going to sand basically in reverse from the majority of it. So then the dust actually goes straight down into my extractor over here. Basically using flexible soft pad underneath. We we'll start off a bit of 120 because I've got a little bit of torn out grain just on the end grain. Turn the speed down a little bit.
And I'll just go over to a bit of hand sanding just to get into the places where I couldn't get into with the power sanding. Look, not too bad. One little spot there, a little bit of tear out. So I've just got to go through all the different abrasives. I keep all my abrasives basically on a velcro block. I'll just put that. So basically, got a piece of board, piece of velcro on it. So I can have all my abrasives already lined up, so it's quick and easy to swap between them. And quite often what I'll do is start off with one abrasive in reverse, the next abrasive I will do in the um, forward motion. Normally I wouldn't be doing this without my uh, respirator on. Well, you need to start with an abrasive that will get rid of your tool marks. The next abrasive is only there to get rid of the scratch lines left from the previous abrasion. You need to remember that you can only do so much with each. There's no point trying to take out scratches left from the 120 when you get down to 400 because you'll be there forever and a day. Back to the 180, I forgot to finish these edges off with the 180. <laughs> Two forty. Twenty. I'm using any pressure. If the brazier is getting hot, then you're using too much pressure. And I know a lot of us turners like to be quite frugal, but a worn out piece of 20 really isn't the same as a knackered piece of, uh, well, a piece of 400 that can't be made from a piece of worn out 120. The full leaves and nasty scratches in it. Thank you. 
And then you're always using a, an airline, especially on ash, to get rid of all the dust and muck that's gone into the open pores of the grain. Pack cloth works fairly well. But obviously, I am now putting airborne dust in the atmosphere, which is obviously not very good. I say normally I've got my respirator on, but normally it isn't too much of an issue. But I'm going to put a finish on the underside here now. I'm going to use some chestnut hard wax oil. This is applied with a bit of kitchen roll. Well, this is a slightly better quality kitchen roll. I'm going to make sure I get it right down into the grooves. So I've just cut there as a little bit of decoration. Obviously, I don't always leave the, the foot showing. Um, quite often, I'll uh, put spigot on there and turn it with the spigot. I just find sometimes it's a quicker, easier job, not to, uh, it's one process I haven't got to worry about. Unfortunately, where I live in Lower Stoft, it's quite a poor town and the uh, amount of free money that's around that like purchase my work or anybody else's is, uh, isn't very much. I'm just gonna turn my extractor off so I'm not sucking the fumes of the oil straight into the extractor. piece like this in the workshop would probably end up getting one coat of finish at the moment and then another couple of coats applied later on once it's all dried off. A couple of questions for you Darren while you're doing that. Yes Paul. Um, one was what shape did you change your long grind from and to on your bowl goad? Basically a, a very hit and miss grind. It was when I bought my first grinder setup, I hadn't really looked into grinds and it came with various things on it and I didn't really know what I was doing. So I managed to get something that sort of looked like a, a grind. Um, got used to using it. And when I went to try and grind it through a, a more conventional fingernail type grind, I just ended up having lots of, sort of problems and things. So I just, uh, Got so many long grind tools, I thought rather than just keep grinding them all to a different shape, I'll grab one in a second as soon as I've got this on here. That's the problem when you when I started, it was a while before I joined any clubs and it was always all self-taught. Um, no one seen me how to sharpen tools, so it's literally just a case of I saw something on in a magazine, tried to sharpen it to the same thing, and thought, well, this isn't working, but it works, it cuts wood. It gets me the finish I want, so it will do. Um, so, um, somebody else asked, is your laser VB36? This one is, yeah. Yep. I've got an another one. Let me get my, um, which camera are we on? Um, okay, work which camera, I've got so many cameras going on, I know, that's my, my face cam. So yeah, I currently work on the VB36. And over there, I've got a Wodkin RS8. And then over underneath the window, the other side of me, I've got a little, uh, let me get my backside out of the way. Where are we? A little Magma 175, same as the Axminster little tool. Um, did most of my bowls and normal work basically on, on the VB, basically because it's big enough and sort of heavy enough do what I needed to do for the majority. Um, production work, spindles, etc., are all done on the Wodkin. Um, it is one of the tools that that's quite for most people that's quite a strange grind because I've ground a lot of the metal off 
down here, as opposed to it coming up in a nice neat shape up to that, like that angle. But it just happened to be when I set the jigs all up, that was what I got the first time I used it. After grinding for hours, trying to grind all this metal away, not realizing I was doing it wrong. And then most of them have ended up staying like it because I've never got round to wanting to spend all the time grinding it to a proper fingernail grind. But they still work for me. But when students come in, they just think it's such an odd grind. They want to uh, change it. Um, basically, my VB36 um, I bought from Stephen Cooper. Some of you remember, might remember the name. I think he's still doing a little bit here and there. Um, but I saw it advertised on Toolpost. Um, it wasn't working. He'd been told that it was going to cost him somewhere in the region of one to one and a half thousand pounds to get it repaired. I took a punt thinking that my Wadkin I've converted to variable speed using an inverter. So I thought if need be, I can just use the same inverter and just have a big jack plug going between both machines so I can use one or the other. Um, so I went and paid £2,000 for a broken BB36. Um, got it home, started stripping it apart, heard a funny buzzing noise, and then there was no volt release switch. It was faulty. We placed that for £12.76. So I got a BB36 for £2,000, £2,012.76. And it came with all the, all the bells and whistles. Um, I've never had the heart to uh, tell Stephen Cooper what was wrong with his uh, lathe. But otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to afford such a nice lathe. My Wadkin I bought for £600. That's my second ever lathe. And it cost me about another four or five hundred pounds to convert it to variable speed. But basically between the machines, I've pretty got the ability to turn anything up to. Um, well, the biggest thing I've turned to date on the Wadkin on the outboard end was a door. Six foot six by th two foot six spinning around on the end. That was quite interesting to turn. Um, But generally my bowls, hollow forms, etc., tend to be done on here. So basically I just let the hard wax oil soak in a little bit. Just heat cured it with a bit of clean cotton, lint-free cloth. Got one little bit of plunge in there. That's basically the underside done. That will be a bit sticky. Another question, what software are you using for your video? Um, it's OBS. Um, yeah, I've got four cameras, two um, Logitech, either 925s or 930s, and one Logitech 920 running through OBS software um, using the Stream Deck and then using um, audio meter for the sound um, but hopefully with the, the various cameras I've managed to get the, all the white balance and stuff sort of fairly similar and hopefully they're reasonably good images it did cost me quite a lot of money to set up but I was one of the uh, fortunate sort of turners that actually tries to earn the living doing this and that because I've actually got a shop and a gallery when COVID struck and I had to shut my shop, I was uh, lucky enough to be one of the ones that received uh, the grant, um, which has basically afforded me to get all this lot. Um, I think I've, at the moment, I think I've spent around about £1,800 on three monitors, four cameras, the boom arms, which you can see up. Um, I can't see it on there. Um, Base cam. These boom arms here, which all hang down from the from the wall in front of my lathe, all move around to get them wherever I want them. Um, so yeah, so in some ways felt a bit awkward or a bit uncomfortable with the fact that so many people didn't 
get any help at all from the government, but then I got quite a lot. Um, but I did spend it within about three days, so I thought that's quite quite good going. Um, I just started buying all this equipment and also bought all the new dust extractor and six inch ducting throughout both workshops. So again, I'm going to go back to this is one of the tools that I've just started grinding again to a different. I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not. You see what I can see on there. So as you can see, this top edge here, you can see that's more of a standard grind, tapering up to nothing on the edge of the wing. And obviously, I'll keep, I'll keep grinding it now until I get rid of all this lot. And that should be a pretty much a standard grind long grind tool rather than my Heath Robinson affair from about 10 years ago. So again I'm just going to do some pull cuts. Because the top half of my body is staying in the same position and I'm just rocking my hips forwards and backwards on my legs. Not trying to take any cuts too big because I know this wood is a bit temperamental and I don't want the rim to be uh, pulling apart. Just looking, see what diameter I've got here or what thickness I've got here. It doesn't take too much more off there. I want to work out approximately where my bowl is going to be. I'm going to put my pencil down. So the bowl part will probably be around maybe that diameter. So everything on this side will be chainsaw textured. This will be the clean bowl with a bead to match just to frame it. That'd be something like that. I can see I've still got some wood here that I've got to get back down to a fresh cut. That's still the sawn cut edge there. So I've got to do a few more passes. Check. I can still feel a little bit, got a little patch here where it's still the original saw, saw marks going all across the grain. I can lose that in the uh, texturing in a moment. I just want to make slightly more pronounced concave part on here so the whole thing is, looks more convex. I've got to take a little bit more meat out of the inside here. Well, I've got the same tool in my hand, just, just use that. Convex surface on here, just got to blend the two shapes together. I'm going to do that just with the pull cut, just taking off a light little bit across the crown.
most of this piece in the middle here is going to be taken away for the bowl. Um, so it's actually now going to get in my way when I start doing the chainsaw texturing. So I want to start getting that out of the way, getting it flat to what the depth is just down here. I'm going to go in with a long grind tool because I've got it in my hand and do, do some pull cuts. Earlier. If the tool's doing the job it's supposed to be doing, you can really need this other hand. It's going to do the job it's supposed to be doing. I've got proper bevel rub. So I've got the cutting edge supported. Obviously, if you come into the middle there, we've got a little bit of a funny bit. All that wood in the middle there is now out of the way. I've got a little indentation around here. You can just see it above my finger there. So that's roughly going to be where my bowl will be cut from. So now I want to mark out the perimeter so I can get some idea on the where I'm going to be using the chainsaw cutter. I'm going to lift the tool rest up fairly high. Um, sometimes I do these with the the pattern raiding out, put it down, raiding out straight from the center. So I can just put my tool rest on the center line. Basically, just go around marking some lines. I'm not going to be cutting these exactly. It just gives me an indication when I'm going around. Um, you see the lines. So basically, all radiates from the center center point as I go around. I think they look generally look quite nice if you can get them to run roughly from the edge of the line of the bowl. So it looks like almost like it's spiraling. Until the rest is just catching on the other side. So basically on these lines now is what I will follow, not the original ones. You'll be pleased to hear I'm not actually going to be using a still 660 or an 880 in the workshop. I'll be using a angle grinder with a four and a half inch chainsaw cutter on it. I've also got the two and a half or two inch crocs on. There's a crocs on tool. It is actually a proper chainsaw on there, all from King Arthur Tools. Works really well, but the amount I use these things, especially for my bigger bull sculptures. Um, I think this is the third one now, um, and this one's nearly burnt out. The others are just burnt out, the gearbox melts. So next time I buy a small one, it'll probably be one of Nick Agar's, because his ones apparently have got all metal gears. Um, So what I'm going to be using today is basically a four and a half inch cordless angle grinder with a four and a half inch chainsaw cutter on it. Um, these things look lethal and they are if you put your fingers anywhere near that bit when it's spinning. This has got both handles attached. So I'll have one hand on the main grip, which will be on where I turn the power on and off. And the other hand will be up here at no time will I put my fingers anywhere near this end while I'm actually got the thing spinning. Just gonna move my tool rest out of the way a little bit. Otherwise it makes a funny clunking noise when I hit it with the angle grinder. Um, the headstock on a BB is on plain bearings rather than ball bearings. So it actually takes quite a lot of effort to turn the shaft. 
as opposed to a normal lathe where you've done that, it would just carry on spinning for a few revolutions. So I shouldn't need to use my indexing. I should literally just be able to use the, uh, the friction within the headstock. Um, I'm gonna just take my headset off and put some face protection on. So I'm gonna be uh, off hearing you for a minute. I'm going to use um, flow. This is what I normally use when I'm working. Let's get it on the camera. Um, air goes into the back. The battery pack and the filter all hang off my back. Um, so it gives me good face protection and lung protection. Uh, but for the day, I'll just use this uh, little yellow one I've just got on my head, which you'll see in a moment. Put this one on for now, at least uh, you can see what I'm doing. Convert to obviously, while I'm doing this, I'm not going to be able to speak to you because I can't get, don't think I can get my headphones on over the top of this very comfortably. I haven't tried it. Right. They may stay on there, they may not. Basically, I'm going to keep two hands on the tool as much of the time as possible. When I want to move the piece of work round, I'll move the tool away from the edge, move it round a bit, pick up the tool again, bring it back towards the work. So never to have my hand anywhere near the blade. Uh, it will make a bit of noise. I will get my dust extractor on. But basically, I'm now roughly going to be following these, these lines. Um, sometimes there'll be long cuts, other times there'll be short cuts. Um, just try and create some shape. I think now if you can hear me over the noise, you, uh, you would imagine that the tool is going to be incredibly grabby. But the first I'm only actually really contacting well, pretty much one tooth at a time if I stop it. Because I'm doing it at an angle, I've really only got one tooth touching the wood at any one time. So there's hardly any friction there during the cut. Um, there was a chap in America. Um, you know, I spoke to him several times, he was trying to get these tools banned and when I saw him, he had a picture of him, he had all his hand all bandaged up and he said he'd done it working on a bowl. And I said, well, I've done hundreds of bowls with this and I've never even nicked myself, let alone mangled my fingers up. Turns out he was sitting down on his porch, holding a bowl, grinding the inside of the bowl out with this, got half a dozen teeth to bite at once, it ran up and went straight up his arm and cut all his fingers. 
So I did inform him that it wasn't the tool that was dangerous, it was the tool holding the tool that was dangerous, and he's never spoken to me since. So, but literally, I can literally hold it in like two fingers, so I can do that right on the end time a second. It's literally just getting over the surface, it's not trying to grab, it's moving too quick, the resistance to the cut is minimal. Move it out of the way, move it around a bit more, pick up the handle. Rid of my, uh, my helmet now, so a bit more comfortable. So basically, now I've got the face of it on one close up can. Basically, all textured. Sometimes I do these and I'll just blow torch this now, scorch the high points, leave the low points uh, natural. You can go over this with something like a wire brush or possibly one of the bristle brushes from. 3M, which would basically, this at the moment feels quite coarse to the touch, and I want it smooth to the touch, but with all the texture. So something like this, which is a 3M bristle brush, there's, I think there's five or six different leaves in here. Um, each one of these little bristles is impregnated with, I think, 80 grit on this one. Uh, I've got another one, which has got finer bristles, and that one's impregnated with 120 grit in each of these bristles work really well. We'll get into the texture. And we'll soften that up and just take them hard edges off quite nicely. Um, I normally end up low torching them. But what I'm going to do is I'll turn off my extractor. Quickly blow over the lathe with my airline. Put the dust onto the floor. And then immediately underneath the lathe, I'll just sweep up the shavings so there's nothing directly underneath the lathe that could catch fire should I have a hot element, a hot ember rather, dropping off. Right, just swept up a little bit, so underneath my feet now. It's pretty much clear directly underneath here. Got a little bit of shaving in that little corner there. It should be fine. I'm going to use a plumber's propane blowtorch. I've got a bottle of water ready to. Uh, that one. I've got a bottle of water, so if I see any bits starting to burn too much, I can just quench it with uh, the water. I've got a fire extinguisher just up there, and I've got another one just through the door behind me. So all I'm going to do is just really click over it and just try and burn off any of the soft fibres that have been brought up. Just soften the edges of the texturing.
I just find this quicker and gives me what I, the effect that I want. But the uh, bristle brush or even a bit of abrasive rub along will do just as good a job. Literally, if I see something that's just burning a little bit too much, I'm going to squirt over it and that'll be out immediately. I normally have a mist spray on this uh, bottle, but I've used it for something else. Let me just change that. Pick that up. Obviously, you've got to be very careful with your insurance if you've got insurance for your workshop, whether you have use of hot flames. Um, I am insured for use of naked flames because I also do that building work and quite often end up doing a bit of plumbing. So I'm covered both by my builder's insurance and by my workshop shop insurance. Sometimes on your insurance it will say you're not covered for hot work, in which case uh, I would just go over with a wire brush or something to take them bits off. I'm going to cool that down. I don't think there's anything burning on there, but I'll just spray it over lightly with a mist coat of water. That will just help it cool it down. That's going to be quite warm to the touch. And in a minute or two, I want to be putting some uh, wax and stuff on there. So because I've now charred a little bit of the outside edges, they're going to be very soft on these black pits. So I now need to get rid of some of the black charring. Because otherwise it will break off. I'll put a finish over the top and it will break off if someone rubbed too hard on it anyway. It's just getting rid of the, the worst of it. I want to keep some black underneath it because that will help with the color of the waxes when I put them on. That actually feels, although it's textured, it still feels soft to the touch. I quite happily run my hands over that back of my hand. Without any risk of any splinters or anything sharp going into my fingers. I'm just going to pop the airline on there for a couple of seconds just to try and get that temperature down. The next stage is to put verdigris wax on there, and if it's too warm, the wax basically just melts and runs away. Feels fairly good. There's a food company now that's producing a verdigris wax. This one. I buy from a company in Norwich, which is my nearest big city. Um, and it's just called Verdigree Wax. So it is literally just a wax with a green color to it. But I think Lebron, I think it's Lebron, I think they do one and they got it in the uh, Axminster catalog. So basically I'm gonna apply what looks like a lot, but basically I want to get this wax to go right down into the bottom of these grooves that I've cut away and I'll be careful not to splatter over the top so I contaminate the what will be the bottom of the bowl. So generally I tend to go along the grain first make sure it's all in there and then just go over the top taking off the excess Obviously, colouring and texturing isn't everybody's cup of tea, which uh, is not a problem. Um, but I've always been interested in the colouring and texturing of wood, 
Um, I tend not to color and texture wood that's got really nice color, grain, etc. Which is why I do most of my coloring and texturing on uh, sycamore or ash. It tends to be quite bland wood at the best of times. And the stuff I've been buying recently is really is quite uninteresting. I did pick up some wood the other year, which had lots of olive in the center, and I haven't colored any of that at all. So it's not a case of I color absolutely everything and anything. A lot of my work is natural. But I do find that probably 90%, 85, 90% of the work I sell, either from the shop or at shows, galleries, etc., is nearly all colored and or textured. So the fact I'm actually trying to earn the majority of my living through my wood turning um, is a struggle to earn enough money, I must admit. And I still do a bit of building work um, to supplement having the shop. But um, the sales in the shop, generally, it's people, people come in, see something that's been colored and textured and think, oh, it's different. The usual thing is, oh, we often go to craft fairs and we see brown round bowls and they're all pretty much the same. So, uh, so when they see something of mine and they see color and texture, and I try and keep the prices affordable. Basically, I'm in Lowestoft, it's, let's say it's poor town. So I have to try and sell my work at a rate that's affordable to not only the locals, but to the holiday makers who come generally come to Lowestoft, which tend to be um, people with slightly lower incomes. So that's basically covered all over now. So it basically looks like, well, some might say I've completely ruined it, which is obviously uh, your opinion. Ideally, I want to leave that to go off and go nice and hard. Um, at least dry somewhat but we're not going to have the time to uh, to do that. So I'm going to get a piece of cotton rag and literally I want to take off the green that's on the high points, leaving the rest of the green in the lower spots where it is. Hopefully now you can see the black starting to shine through. Now that's completely contaminated. So I want to find a clean bit of cloth. I'll go back to the close up cam. Hopefully you can see it like over here where it's much darker. You see where I've taken it off back down to the, the scorched timber because that's where I'm now going to be putting the next coat of wax onto. Question for you Darren. Yep. Do you have any issues with the wood cracking when you're blow torching it? Um, no because it's literally I don't keep it in one spot for very long at all. Um, so it never it gets warm you can put your hand on it even when I just done it I'd put my hand on it it gets warm but it's not like too hot. Um, the wood is generally kiln dried, so it's not a case of um, heating up the moisture in the wood, which will uh, then change it. But I've turned things down to one millimetre thickness and put a blowtorch on it. Okay, a pencil flame. Um, as long as you're careful, you've got a squirty water bottle so you can quench it. So far, that's wood. I've never had a problem with anything cracking. But there's always a first time. So I've taken the worst of the, the green off the high spots. And this time I actually remembered to get some gloves. I've done these quite often at uh, demos around the country. And quite often I forget to take a pair of gloves with me and end up coming out of the demo and driving home, going to uh, get some food on the way. And I'm covered in gold wax and multicolors around my fingernails and quite often get some very, well, I get some strange looks. I get some stranger looks than I normally do. So I'm going to put some gold wax in the palm of my hand, smear it all over, and now really lightly, I'm just going to flick over the top. 
I don't want lumps of wax going in into the texture. I literally want the wax to be laying on the on the surface. Just gonna get a little bit more. I'm just gonna so basically at the moment I've used probably about size of about a garden pea sort of size of amount. So I've put some on, I'm just gonna put some on. I'm making sure I haven't got any lumps of it on my on my fingers and I'm literally just gonna add some over the top. If you let the first coat harden and go off before you put the second coat on, you can actually build up the layers quite quite nicely and get a real good depth of shine. But of course I want to try and do this in one one hit. I'm having to add it a bit heavier than what you might normally do in one, one coat. You can see the inside of the bulb will be natural wood and probably just oiled. The outside is going to be coloured and textured, but you can still see the grain through the colouring and texturing as well. So I'm not completely covering a piece of wood to try and hide that it's wood. I look at it as I'm trying to enhance what would other be a quite plain, simple ash bowl. And if I'd done a bowl like this, just plain and simple, probably in the shop, it'd probably sell for 30 quid, maybe 40 quid if I'm lucky. Something like this I'd normally sell for somewhere between 100 and 125 pounds in the shop. And the amount of time extra it takes me, maybe another hour to put the coloring and texturing and stuff on. I basically end up getting three to four times the amount of money for it. So even by my country bumpkin maths, I think that's still quite a good return for my, for my time. The, the gold that I rubbed in my hand originally, I think it's so hot in here, it basically the solvent just evaporated too quick. It must be somewhere in the region about 90 degrees in my workshop at the moment. Absolutely roasting. So if it's a bit cooler, what you could do is literally just go over the top of my hands in one sort of sweep with that normally just put a nice thin smear over everything. Obviously this uh, wax is in a solvent, so that's uh, evaporating away quite quickly in the, in the warmth. Um, this, like I said, is um, Libron's wax. It's actually called Chantilly Gold. Um, I used to use um, chestnuts gold wax, but at some point they changed the uh, the formulation and it's not the same as it used to be and I wasn't quite happy with it so although I had sort of half a dozen tubs of the stuff I uh, stopped using it it doesn't give me the, the effect that I wanted so hopefully on there you can see that the the light actually looks a bit washed out, but the gold is actually quite pronounced. I just don't think you'll see it until I take it off the lathe. What time do we normally finish, Paul? I can't hear you, Paul. You're muted. Good point. Um, yeah, whenever you're done, really, there's no fixed time. Right. Okay, so I'll just carry on. I don't know if that was two hours or hour and a half or... Yeah, I mean, if, if you want to just finish the inside of the bowl, that's fine. Um, yep. yep, time for that. You all again. Right. Ideally, over that, I might just take a, I'll put a coat of gloss lacquer. 
Uh, putting a coat of gloss, acrylic gloss lacquer over wet wax really shouldn't work. But for whatever reason, it seems to soak into the wax and bind it all together. We have just got to let that go off and dry a little tiny bit. The reason I need to get to it on there is obviously because it's so hot in here, that wax is still quite soft and any dust shavings, whatever, that come off from me turning the inside of the bowl is going to end up straight into the wax and I won't be able to get it off. At least with one coat of wax in there, or one coat of lacquer rather, over the top, that'll at least make it slightly better. It'll give me a better chance of finishing it off. Another question for you, Darren. Do you ever yep. use the same technique with gold paint instead of gold wax? Um, yeah, I've done it. And I've done it with um, like Joe Sonia gold iridescent paints and things. Done the texturing, sprayed it black, and then gone over the top with iridescent paints. Exactly the same thing. I just find that the gold wax, from, for what I'm trying to do it in a demonstration or whatever, just works quicker and easier. Because if you actually leave the wax on there to dry, put another coat over the top and leave it like overnight, you can actually buff it up to a really high shine. Um, just basically a gilding wax. Um, I'm trying to see if I've got, um, trying to see what I've got in the workshop or in the gallery, in the gallery part. Uh, but what I say, quite often I don't use gold lacquer. Um, I tried it with gold um, spray paint um, from sort of a car shop. Um, and then texture it afterwards, leaving some of the gold on, it sort of worked. Um, but I just find the wax generally for me is a quicker, quicker solution to get to where I want to in the end of the day. It's still a little tiny bit sticky. Um, I'm just gonna go over the, the airline again to see if I can just try and dry that just a fraction. Ideally, what you'd be leaving it for about 20 minutes. But as long as I can just get the surface just to dry a little tiny bit, we can carry on curing underneath, hopefully. Normally, I cure stuff with heat, so I'd put the uh, airline on it, or the uh, hairdryer rather on it. Obviously, with all these waxes, that's just going to soften them up even more. Right. It's going to take too long to dry, so we'll just carry on, and then I might just have to sort of give it a little braid or we'll brush off later on once it's gone off. So on this outside edge here, let's put the camera over here on. Um, I want to put a bead around this outside edge here to match the one on the underside here. So again, I'll do that with the three point tool. And depending on how deep I've gone with the texturing on this outside edge, that will control how deep I need to make my bead. So I'm going to go screw on the surface and just take off the surface until I can get down to solid wood without any of the texturing showing through it. It's mainly the crown of the bead that needs to be clear, the rest of it will be pretty much cut away. A little bit more off. Blunt. Um.
one little bit left up there that needs to come off. Just making sure my depth of my beads from both sides aren't too compatible. If they're exactly the same size, I could end up going all the way through and just having a ring come off. Pretty much got rid of all the evidence of the chainsaw texturing. So I just need a braiding in a in a minute or two. Now I want to make a line here somewhere so I know where my bowl is going to be. So I'll just go in here with a feed point tool, give myself a mark to work to. So from now on, it'll just be a case of hollowing out the bowl, same as you would any other bowl. I'm going to work from the center outwards. So all rest is slightly too low. Turn up the speed a bit more. probably see I'm actually using my body a lot of the time to create the shape rather than arms if you just use your arms there is that you've got all these linkages our wrists our elbows our shoulders and any movement amongst any of them will create movement onto the surface of the wood I'm using my body as a bit of a dead weight Steady the tool. I've got the tool rest in the way now. I'm just going to drop the tool rest out of the way. use that wing just run across the bottom edge just clean that little pip out it's constantly checking i know i've got a dovetail recess in the back so i've got to be a bit careful I do, I do. on the entry to a bowl if you close the flute completely so the flute's pointing basically at three o'clock so looking at the at there so in the place where you can see it so that would be like three o'clock twelve o'clock nine o'clock basically if you close, close the flute completely so the flute is pointing horizontally line up your bevel with your angle that you want to start off going into your piece so let's go ahead so if I want a straight sided entry the angle that my tool's got to be at to be to get a 90 degree entry point here there's no point trying to come around here and try to push the tool in because you're not going to get a nice i want a nice sharp entry point and then goes into the curve rather than a very shallow hole um, and also if you close the flute off when you when you start and basically have your thumb or something behind it you should be able to literally have the tool handle down low close the flute as it comes up lift the tool 
once you've got this close-up cam, once you've created this little tiny shoulder in here, which I then did up to that point there, uh, eight of an inch shoulder here now, I can then rest the bevel on that, open the flute, there's my rub, open the flute, there's my cut, and I can push in, I've got bevel support, Still just bouncing a little bit, so I'm pushing down onto the floor. And come back again, do the same thing. I'm dropping the handle, closing the flute. My bit cross head again. So my bevel here is pointing straight along the line of the spindle of the lathe. Handle down low, flute closed. Got my hand here protecting it, so I've got something to push against in case it wants to skid over. Put the tool handle. There's my shoulder. Go from here again, so from here, close the flute, handle down low, lift the handle, nice and gentle, pick up the cut. So I've now got nearly a quarter of an inch cut I can do there. My bevel is rubbing the shoulder that I've just formed. So then I can start pulling the handle round, forming the shape that I want. I don't do it on every cut because generally I know what I'm trying to achieve and I'll use my left hand with a fair bit of pressure pushing hard onto the tool rest so the tool literally can't slide past it so it may snatch but it doesn't tend to run because I'm basically holding it too, too tightly. I'm just going to run around, going to run up the, the curve on the wing of the tool and then come back down towards the centre all the way up here. Come around for that little tiny pip area again. So I'm just going to lift the tool handle up onto that. And hopefully, pip again with the fibers that I've ripped off before. Hopefully, in the center now that'll be fairly clean. So I can just go over with a little tiny bit of abrasive, and that will be fine. Just going to check what it feels like, feels fairly good. Got one slight little ridge just before the center there. I can just feel it probably come out with the first abrasive. Off. Here we are. So now I need to do the a bead to match. I want to be similar size to what's on the outside, what you can see on here, um, just to frame the bowl part. So again, I'll go in with the three point tool. And just start taking off some of the edge. So now I'm gonna try and go in. I'm gonna try and go in from this angle so the bead actually wraps around the so again now I've got my fingers on the tool rest, holding it fairly tight so that it could try and skid. Tool rest we've got a bit blunt. I can create that arc as much the way around in one smooth movement, pulling it around with my arm, I should be able to get a reasonably clean and smooth curve. I just need a bit of braiding. I can still see a little tiny bit of green on this outside edge of the, of the top of the crown of the let me take a little bit more off there.
tiny, tiny little bit of green on there. So I think that will do. So I'll get rid of the tool rest. Make sure I'm happy with the, with the shape. I've got plenty of meat in the bottom. So I'll stick it in reverse. And now I'll start doing the, the braiding. Put the extractor on. I'm going to clean up around the beads first. Start off with a bit of 120. Obviously, you've got to be careful not to go over to the edge of the chainsaw textured part. So I'm just folding it, sl sliding it into the groove, and pulling it out and round and over the top. I'll do the exactly the same here. I've got the lathe in reverse, so I'm working on here so the wood is actually going upwards. Saying so that way, if anything grabs, my fingers are being elongated rather than crushed down on top of each other. They tend to break more being crushed that way than they do being elongated. So I've been told. It certainly feels a lot less painful uh, than putting your fingers in the downward position. Back to my power sanding. Stop with a quick look. They always stop after the first abrasive, and if I'm happy with, the, with what it looks like, I'll then carry on. It feels smooth enough. I've got no, nothing now I need to worry about. So I'm going to go over to, over to the 180. I need to do all these edges with the 180. Go for 320, that should be enough. It's going to be an oil finish on the inside again, and on the outside edge here. Little tiny wispy bits that have come loose. Probably because the finish hadn't gone off enough on here before I started cutting it, it's just peeled back a little tiny bit. I'm just going to try and take them off with a, with a bit of abrasive by hand.
And I'll be using a much smaller brush, but this was handy. So again, I'm just going to put a coat of the hard wax oil. Make sure I'm all the way into this groove that we formed. Not the best brush. Make sure I get into the bottom of the groove on the face. I'm going to do the same on this outside edge. Just going to hold the bristles together to make it a little bit more accurate. Not too worried if a little bit goes over the, the surface, because that should wipe off once everything's gone completely dry. Find a clean bit of my cloth. I don't want to start putting green wax over everything. Just even out that coat, same on the outside edge. The lathe is still going in reverse, so I'm like a small pad. I'm not going to wrap it around my fingers, so literally I can hold it between two or three fingers, if anything catches, I'll do it with my grip and it will disappear. Get rid of them little bits of cotton hanging off. Increase the speed of it. And so much as a bit of dust all sticking on the surface of the lacquer that I put on top of the check string. That, that, most of that will probably brush off in the morning, so it should only just be laying on the surface. If I try and take it all off now, chances are I'm going to push it further in. I shall have a look in a second. Got little bits up there. I'm just using a basic paintbrush, just uh, quite gently, just trying to get some of that dust off. There's the odd little tiny bit of shaving that's uh, stuck in the surface. Obviously, I'm over the top of wax, so it's still going to stay wet for a few hours yet. But that should just about be it. Um, I can find my chuck key, I'll take it off. I'll go on the overhead cam and then hopefully we'll see the colour of the gold a bit a bit better. Basically just a piece of ash underside. Done. Nothing too fancy about the shape. Got my little central mark in so I can drill that out with a 35 mil force in a bit and put in my uh, little name tag. So basically now it just needs to sit till the tomorrow morning and I can put another coat even over the top here 
tomorrow I can put the um, hard wax oil and I can go over the top of it now with hard wax oil as well so I can cover the whole thing with hard wax oil once this lot has gone off properly over, over the time, overnight or whatever. So there we are. Great, thank you very much Darren, that's a very interesting demo. You're welcome. I'll, I'll unmute them so they can uh, join in and ask questions if they wish. Let me give me a sec. Right, you should all be able to unmute yourselves if you want to. Yeah, it's, it's easy if you actually ask questions rather than put it on the uh, chat box typey yeah. thing because I'm going to have to run over and get me thing and try to type while I'm trying to look at the screen. It gets all very awkward for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Darren, Darren yes. is it possible to show the three point tool that you were using? Um, yep. Thank you. Um, I've got basically two of them. Let me put it up to the uh, close up cam. They call it a three point tool, but basically, let me just try and get that the focus. I'm going to try and get in front of it. So basically, there is only one, one point, but it's got three faces to it. And basically, I just sharp them up, and there's another one slightly smaller. Smaller size. Just going to back my hands about something better. So that's a really fine pointed one. Is that just a round, like, like a piece of rod? Yeah, just a piece of round bar. Bar, yeah, round bar, yeah. yeah. It's still tool steel. Okay. Um, so it's still quality piece of steel. I think um, I've actually got Ashley Isles. I think that was a piece of Ashley Isles tool steel that I bought one, one of the shows. Yeah. And then just basically ground it. Normally all I do is set it up on the grindstone and just basically sort of lay it on the grindstone, take it off, move it around roughly 120 degrees, put it on again. What you end up with on each of these little shoulders, you end up with a little raised burr and that's what you use as a cutting edge. Oh, okay. But it works. They work really well for nice crisp little detail pieces. Um, and I just find them a lot easier to cut a bead on the inside of a bowl like I did there and try to put some any other tool in there. And I've got bead forming tools, but sometimes they don't always get in where you want them to do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, they work really well. Very yeah, simple, very basic. Thank you very much. I think one or two of the tool manufacturers do actually sell them. Um, so you can buy one ready, ready made, but or you can buy a bar and make yes. your own. Yeah. Yeah, obviously much cheaper. We can turn our own handles, just get a bit of tool steel. And people like Ashley Isles, we see them at the shows when we get back to doing shows. Um, they generally have lumps of um, generally have lumps of bar for sale. So then you can put whatever grind you want on them. You can make your own skewgee gouge or um, detailing tools. Um, so rather than buying stuff off the shelf at twenty plus pound a time, try and make some of your own things that do the jobs that you want them to do. Yeah. So that angle that you put on there, just by doing it round at 120, gives you the angle that you need on the on the face of the the uh, bevel. Um, yeah, basically, as you look on the end of it, because I've got three faces, I've got 360 degrees oh, no. <laughs> around it. So I need 120, 120, 120. Um, what the what the angle is on the point, <laughs> it, 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 it it does vary because it'll depend on where I hold it on the on the. On the grinder when I do it, sometimes the, the point is, is sharper, other times. Um, so you have a longer or a shallower, depending on you. Yeah, so you've got the two, two there, oh, you can yeah. see the difference on them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this one, I've, got, I've ground less off these edges since I've sharpened it, so the edge is a little bit smaller than what they might be sometimes. Um, it tends to get blunter and blunter because I don't like sharpening it all the way each time. So I might just touch it on one edge just to grind that up. Then the shape changes and eventually I have to give up and actually grind it back to what it should be and then start again. Um, but incredibly easy tools to use. I say they basically just work as a little scraper. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks very much. You go. You're welcome. Oh, we've just got a message come up. Yeah, good for cutting dovetails too. Yeah, you can cut them with your, your dovetail going into the bottom. Yeah. Because um, if you use the point, it will cut the, it will slice through the fibers. And then obviously the wing then cuts 
or takes away the excess timber. So uh, very quick and easy to use. I tend to use a skew chisel um, just because most of my skew chisels are cut to 15 degrees or ground to 15 degrees. So they'll do the job I need them to do. And I've normally got at least one skew chisel on the shelf that's sharp. <laughs> Anyone else got any questions? Yeah. Right, where'd you buy the wax? Um, the verdigris wax came from a shop in Norwich called Classic Finishers. Um, but I think you can now buy it through Axminster. I think Lieb uh, Liberon, I think, are now doing a verdigris wax, which you can get from Axminster Power Tools. Um, the gold wax, again, that's a Liberon product. You can buy that in places like Brewers. Um, Possibly from Maxminster, I can't remember. I bought it online from a strange named company, um, Rest Express. Um, yeah. I'll get it on there. Um, they seem to do lots of different finishes. I'm just going to focus on there, possibly not, because I'm too. Hopefully, you can see that. Um, basically, this tub is what was it, 100 mils. The smaller tubs, I think, are 25 mil or something like that. How hard mil. does it get? Well, hard enough to buff. Um, yeah. That's, that's yeah. like a standard size for chestnut. Yeah. One of the bigger tubs. So that's 100 mil in there. That's 30 mils. I bought this from Rest Express, and I think it cost me one and a half times of that size that I could yeah. get from anywhere else. Um, but obviously, it's still, if you're going to use it, I go through quite a lot of it. Although saying that, I've use this heck of a lot and it's still probably two thirds full yeah. and I've probably had that tub for probably two years now and yeah. very rarely does a week go past when I don't use it. So <laughs> you, use, you don't use very much and it does go a long way but it's designed for like um, gilded frames, any damage on them you can yeah. put two or, th yeah. two or three layers on, let it dry in between, once it's completely cured you can then actually go over it with a cloth and actually buff it up to a real high shine. Right. Thanks, Darren. Enjoyed it. Yep. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you.